My wife Letty was locked in the kitchen and sitting on a chair. She looked the way I felt. I was ashamed that I had to lock her up. She tried to run away, and I overreacted. The keys are hidden and not at hand. I have come to terms with this decision for now. Her gorgeous makeup is ruined by tears. A stain of vomit covers the left breast of her little black dress. Standing near the sink, I can smell partially digested wine and bile. When Letty noticed that I had returned home early, she was so shocked and upset that she immediately ran to the toilet to throw up. It didn't turn out so well. While my wife was busy throwing up her lunch, I myself was somewhat shocked and saddened. She allegedly left for a trade show in Atlanta that morning and was not due to return until late Sunday evening. She kissed me goodbye at seven in the morning and left for the four-hour drive to Atlanta. Mid-morning, a semi-trailer trying to make a sharp turn hit an electrical pole outside my store and knocked it over. This led to a power outage. My cinder block gun shop intentionally has no windows, and it was pretty hot that day. For an hour, we were all sweating in the dark, and my employees were loudly demanding hazard pay. They were joking, of course, but only half-joking. We were still waiting for the electrician crew from the co-op when Letty called me. In her cheerful singing tone, she said, Hi, darling. I made it to Atlanta, in the same hotel as last time. I live in a room with one of the girls, registered in her name. I'm currently at the convention center. We are putting the stand in order. We open at two o'clock in the afternoon. After that, don't call me. I won't be able to answer. I'll call you every evening when I'm free and go to dinner. Oops, time to run. Bye, dear. A few minutes later, a team of workers from the electric cooperative finally arrived. Shortly after that, the crew chief came into my store and told me that they had delivered the wrong size pole and that it would be another three hours before they restored power. I closed the store and gave everyone Friday off, and I went straight home, dreaming of a long, cool shower. Imagine my surprise when I walked into the bedroom and there was Letty standing next to the bed. She is wearing an expensive set of lingerie that I bought for her in an expensive boutique during our honeymoon. It featured a full cup bra, garters, and a satin thong, all dark red. Since I gave it to her seven years ago, my wife has only worn it a couple of times. My wife didn't notice me coming in because she was pulling her tight little black dress over her chest and it was covering her head. Letty was strangely unsteady on her feet. I have a sensitive nose and I smelled wine and excitement. On the dresser behind her, I noticed an open bottle of Chardonnay. Nearby, in a small puddle of spilled wine, there was a glass with a sip or two left in it. I figured there was one glass left in the bottle of wine for spirits. This meant that she herself drank at least three glasses, which was excessive for her. She's clearly excited. When Letty is excited, her scent reminds me of peach pie warm from the oven. The smell filled my nostrils. In an instant, I realized that my wife was tipsy, horny, and put on her outfit. I was immediately excited at the thought that I was about to have an unforgettable evening, but it only lasted a second until I remembered that Letty should be in Atlanta now. I immediately realized that she was getting ready to wear her outfit for someone else, for someone here in the area. When her dress slid down to reveal her face, her reaction to me was something I will never forget. My young wife cleared her throat, saying, Sorry, then immediately started coughing and rushed to the bathroom. Watching Letty throw up most of the bottle of Chardonnay along with the rest of her lunch dispelled the possibility that she was planning a special surprise for me. Even as my heart sank and my universe crumbled, I couldn't take my eyes off the sight of her graceful silhouette in a tight dress as she vomited. Her figure is so attractive. I'm sure Bowden Teague also found her figure attractive. Teague is the company's frost-bitten marketing director. Everpart the auto parts manufacturer where Letty works. When a few attractive women wearing cute jeans and tight blouses show up at a trade show booth, the booth's traffic increases fivefold and more orders pour in. Thus, Letty came into his field of vision. A few years ago, Teague drove a van full of women doing intimate dances to work at an exhibition booth, calling them Booth Candy. When employees of the company's HR and legal departments found out about this ever part, they had an explosion like in the movie Meltdown, 
in GTA 5. Mr. Cope, the owner of Everpart, is shamefully lenient towards Tig, but even he could not ignore such a violation. Mr. Cope now requires Tig to use only full-time employees at the stand. Therefore, Tig recruits Candy for the stand from among the available office employees. He asks Letty and half a dozen other slender and pretty women to fill the exhibition stand. He agreed with Mr. Cope that he would call his recruits volunteers and would secretly pay them $1,000 in cash for each day of work. No one is going to complain to management that they're wearing a tight blouse when they're getting paid $1,000 a day in tax-free cash just for talking to people. At her main job, Letty is an accountant and a very good one at that. The irony is that she had to work in the office for almost a whole month to earn as much as she made in one weekend at the exhibition. An interesting demonstration of the law of supply and demand. I hated that Letty had to work at all, but we needed her salary to make ends meet. Pa, my father, was a rich man when he passed away last year. Pa despised trust funds and insisted that his children grow up, knowing what it was worth to earn a dollar. He established that each of his children should open their own business and live only on what they earn until they are 30. Only then are they entitled to receive their share from the family trust. My brother and sister, both a few years older than me, were up to the task and assured me that the experience was worthwhile. They vowed to continue this tradition with their children. As the youngest of Pa's children, I still had two years left. Letty and I lived on the salary she received and on what I could bring from my gun store. I know the phrase, my gun store, sounds lucrative. This is not the case in rural Georgia. The store belonged to my Uncle Kevin and was more of a hobby than a profitable business. Uncle Kevin loved to hunt, and the store gave him the opportunity to interact with the best hunters in our part of the state. The store became mine because a couple of months before I graduated from Georgia Tech, Uncle Kevin had a stroke. Instead of forcing me to start a new business from scratch like my brother and sister did, Pa gave me the opportunity to become a store owner. The advantage was that I did not have to create a new business during an economic downturn when credit is almost unavailable. The downside was that the growth potential was limited. The day Letty puked on our bathroom floor, I had owned the store for seven years and was the world's foremost expert on limited growth potential. I was extremely proud that not one of my five employees missed a single paycheck due to the crappy economy and the vagaries of COVID, and I was confident that with some capital improvements, I could turn the store into a more profitable business, but I couldn't qualify for a loan. I don't have enough collateral to offset the risk, and lending institutions are extremely risk-averse when it comes to financing firearm sales. Letty got a job at Everpart because it is the only company in the area large enough to need a full-time accountant. Consequently, Letty is paid extremely little for her qualifications. Between Letty's salary and what I bring home from the store, we barely make ends meet. In truth, we were doing better than many in the area, and we had nothing to complain about. However, when life throws its curveballs at us, like the water heater leaking or the starter on my pickup failing, we tighten our belts and make do with less, just like everyone else. Letty's cash payments at shows have greatly improved our quality of life. When Bowden Teague asked if she would like to work at an exhibition, she never refused. It took Letty and I ten minutes to clean up her vomit. We worked in silence. Neither of us said a word. Letty didn't want to explain what she was doing at home, dressing for another man. I didn't trust myself to control my temper. I'm usually slow to get angry or lose my temper, but on the rare occasions when I actually get upset, I have real problems with self-control. Today is one of such cases. I've learned that it's much easier to not lose your temper in the first place than to hold yourself back after you've lost your temper. I've been working on this for several years. When we finished cleaning, I wanted us to go into the living room and calmly discuss everything. Letty said that she had to go, otherwise she would be late. When I asked where she needed to be, she closed her mouth and jutted her jaw. She can be incredibly stubborn. After 15 minutes, as I asked increasingly hostile questions, none of which she answered, she said she needed to go to the bathroom. 
Two minutes later, I caught her trying to sneak out into the garage, grabbing a fresh dress on a hanger. She was almost out the door before I noticed. This is where I reacted. After a few minutes, I was able to stop her and sit her down on a chair. I was hoarse from screaming. The only good thing was that I finally had her full attention. She saw me lose my temper and was afraid of becoming the object of it. She was physically safe. My anger was never accompanied by violence. But Letty didn't know that. I scared the living daylights out of her and made her feel like a first-class asshole. The plus is that, sitting in the room, she realized that she was not going anywhere, and she had better talk. I asked, So where were you going? The answer better not be some shitty fake trade show in Atlanta. And then she burst into tears. Later, I asked her, Of all people, did you choose Bodenteague? This man is a pig, and you absolutely despise him. Yes, I hate him. I can't stand him. I knew it was true. Letty's accounting responsibilities fell to Teague's marketing department. She had to communicate with him weekly. He was decent to her, but she hated the way he treated the other women in the office. She practically danced with joy when one of the heads of the inventory department reported his harassment to the Human Resources Department. This was not the first accusation of harassment. Mr. Cope placed Tigu on probation. Tigu should have been fired, but Mr. Cope thought he was a marketing wizard. Even though Tigu kept his job, it was the last straw for his wife. Upon learning of this, she left him, taking her two small children with her. I asked, if you can't stand him, why the hell did you go to his house? I wasn't going to his house, but to a hotel. Just answer the damn question, Letty. I lost the bet. Money? Yes. Bet. I bet him that Georgia would beat Clemson last week. Clemson won that game. Technically speaking, Clemson not only won the game, but also beat the spread by more than two touchdowns. This was not a surprise as Georgia was in a rebuilding state. Before Clemson, they lost five games and were absolutely terrible compared to Georgia. The story was finally starting to make sense. Letty has four older brothers. All five siblings were born within one year of each other. Having four older brothers as rivals turned her into the most epic, hyper-competitive trash talk I've ever encountered. Her full name is Violet Violet, but she doesn't look anything like her. She could grab a guy's face in the blink of an eye. The more she hates someone, the more nasty things she says. So the family started calling her Letty. As a Georgia graduate, she also loves to show off and apparently bet on her beloved bulldogs. This is a dangerous activity for someone who has nothing more than a casual interest in sports. What exactly were the stakes, Letty? She sniffled before speaking. Trip to the British Virgin Islands. Ten days at an all-inclusive resort and a dinner cruise on a sailboat. Bowden takes his wife and children there every year. I would get their ticket in February for you and me. It was very high stakes for us. That is if you win. What if he wins? Initially, the bets were that if he won, he would have me for the whole weekend. Will he get you for the weekend? What does it mean? I knew perfectly well what that meant, but I wanted her to say it herself. Andy, this means that I will be at his disposal. At his disposal for what, Letty? Prepare, clean his toilets, paint the house. She looked down and away from me. In a small voice, she said, Do whatever he wants. You know, in the bedroom. Are you talking about sex? She blushed. Yes, Andy, I mean sex. I took three full breaths before asking in as soft a tone as possible. Letty, don't you think that you should have started with this, with sex? I'm ashamed, Andy. She started crying again. Before she could continue, I said, Let's go back a little. Earlier you said original bets. What does it mean? She really didn't want to answer this question. I began to lose control of myself again and let Letty see the anger building inside me. She immediately started talking. We took the double or zero route. If I win, he still provides first-class travel for two and two thousand in cash. What if he wins? I had to do everything I said before, but I also had to agree to... It was very difficult for her to pronounce this phrase. Agree to take various prohibited substances every day for his sake. He teases that I am Miss Goody Goody and said that he wants to see me relaxed and with my hair down. Prohibited substances? Are you joking? 
He promised that by Sunday afternoon I would be sober as a glass. The heaviest illicit substance Letty had ever taken was a margarita on the rocks, and even then only infrequently. I didn't want to ask this question, but I had to. Who won the initial bet that led you to the double or zero game? She answered, I. She won a trip to the BVI and then doubled down to get more airfare and spending money. She picked the Bulldogs, who are in a slump this year, with such significant stakes. I covered my face with my hand and went out onto the terrace behind our house. Letty put her virtue on the line, won, and then doubled down. It was very difficult to go through this. I had to walk for a few minutes in the cool evening air before I could speak normally again. Returning to the house, I said, You're not going anywhere. The bet is cancelled. Your body belongs to me and my body belongs to you. You can't bet on something that doesn't belong to you, just like I can't bet on my Uncle Kevin's farm. Andy, I don't speak Welsh. He has tried to speak Welsh so many times, and I always tell him off to his department for it. I roasted him and humiliated him. He will do the same to me. How many times have you argued so far, Letty? Twenty-four. Over the past two years, I have won twenty-four times in a row. She was absurdly proud of it, talking about some of the bets. All of them were based on the fact that teams from the top 20 would win against teams from the basement. Bowden always chose the team from the basement. Until last week's bet. I said, and then you lost the 25th bet. The one that was at stake was your loyalty to me and the use of illegal substances. And during all this time, you didn't even think about whether you were being set up. Why did it happen? This loser is so bad at betting that until last week, he had never won against me. Letty, you were set up. Every team he bet on until recently was guaranteed to lose. He lost deliberately. I was proud of how calmly I said this, and then asked, And what were the bets in the previous 24 bets? She answered, The standard rate was a Target gift card. First for $20. The last six or seven times, $100. Target card. She fucking loved Target cards and almost ruined our marriage because of that damn Target card. I poured out the rest of the beer and grabbed some bourbon from the cabinet above the refrigerator. I poured it onto two fingers and threw in a couple of ice cubes. While doing this, I replied, After 24 consecutive bets on small amounts that were easy to hide from me, he suddenly upped the ante to 10 days at an all-inclusive Caribbean resort. Didn't that worry you? Her eyes became big. She clearly didn't look at it the other way. Bowden said that after his wife left him, he didn't want to go on their annual trip. He said that he had already paid for it, and otherwise the money would be wasted. It made sense for him to use her for a bet. Isn't this a reasonable explanation? It was obvious that Tig had Letty trap it in her own ego and greed. The expression on her face is understandable. At least she had the decency to be embarrassed. I asked, and what is the cost of this vacation in monetary terms? Is it enough that his wife wants to claim half the cost in her divorce proceedings? Her lack of response was telling. I continued, Have you ever seen the tickets or booking confirmation? How did you know he even booked the trip? When I asked about it, Letty looked like she was going to be sick. Realization set in, and my wife finally began to understand Teague's plan. It's time to finish it, the way Pa would have done it. Letty, have you thought about what it would be like if you spent the weekend agreeing that he could do whatever he wanted with you? The expression on her face was puzzled. She clearly hadn't thought about this. She thought it would be like one of those passionate love stories she loved. She didn't think about what someone like Tig could do. I said, the conditions were whatever he wants, right? Yes, Andy. Is there any type of sex that you refuse to engage in? She blushed and stared at the floor but still answered, you know what it is. And the bet you agreed to was that you couldn't deny him what you regularly deny me. What if Bowden wants to do this all weekend? What if he wants to keep you doing just that for hours? You agreed to this too. She looked like she was absolutely disgusted. Her expression changed to horror, and she visibly shuddered and began to cry. Strongly. Resign yourself, dear. There is one more thing. You are not taking birth control. We are very careful about what we do and when we do it. What if Bowden decides he prefers not having to use protection? When did your last period end? 
two weeks ago? Aren't you ovulating this weekend? What if he wants you to give birth to his child? You agreed to this. Letty suddenly started vomiting. I brought the kitchen trash can to her. She leaned over him and made a series of screaming sounds, but nothing came out. It was empty as before. From the expression on my wife's face, I realized that she finally understood everything with complete clarity. She cried bitterly and said, What a fool I am, Andy. I didn't want this. It never occurred to me that he would do that, or that he could do that. I was so confident that I would win that I already planned what I would take with me. I shouldn't have made the bet. When I lost, I should have told you. Should have known Welsh. What was I thinking? She began to sob. I sighed tiredly. It's hard to believe, but my wife is actually an incredibly smart woman. She is a certified public accountant and graduated with honors from Georgia. Mr. Cope said he nicknamed Letty the Enchantress for her ingenious ability to make profits disappear from his books. However, she was the youngest and only daughter in a family of seven. Her father is a pastor in a small church, and her large, muscular brothers looked after her fiercely. They scared away anyone who didn't treat Letty with the same respect they did. Only a few were brave enough to go through this ordeal. So before she got engaged to me, Letty led a secluded life in a small town. The fact that she was fooled in this way was due to simple naivety. She didn't know how terrible people could be to each other. Combined with her almost complete lack of imagination about sex, you can understand why an intelligent woman would find herself in this situation. It was also her first exposure to high-stakes gambling. We both know she's a thrill-seeker. Since we started dating, I kept her safe from danger. But this time, I wasn't there. And she got carried away. Now her whole face was covered in snot and tears. Sitting on the chair, she couldn't even wipe it off herself. I gently wiped her face with a damp kitchen towel. I thought it would calm her down, but it had the opposite effect. Her sobs became even stronger. I hit the table and said, Letty, I need you to listen to me right now. Focus, please. Letty pulled herself together again. I continued, This is instant divorce bullshit. No lies. Without any exaggeration. Don't pass by, don't collect $200, get a divorce right away. Understand? Do you know how close I am to hitting the eject lever right now, especially after I caught you and you still tried to sneak away? Letty nodded. Her mouth was tightly closed to keep from crying. I said, I love you with all my heart and I don't want to divorce you, but you need to explain all this crap to me. When she didn't answer, I started bombarding her with questions. Are you tired of me? Have I disappointed you? Are you unhappy with me? Am I not good enough for you? How could you do this to us? Pain involuntarily burst through my voice when I asked these questions. I cursed myself for being raised to never indulge in self-pity. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't keep it to myself. I was sure that my questions would make her cry again. But instead, they calmed her down. She answered furiously, No, honey. No, it's not you at all. You are the best man I have ever met. I'm completely satisfied, Andy, and I want to be married to you. You are the man that I need. Only you. I looked closely at her face. She's not lying to me. She's telling the truth. This is why it is so difficult for me to understand this situation. This is terrible, I said. I, of course, hope that you are telling the truth. You'll have to do a lot of work to get things right. Before we got engaged, I told you my position on infidelity. Just me and everyone. As soon as you do something to someone else first, it's all over between us. You understand this, right? Letty replied, I feel the same way. If you ever... My anger flared, and I interrupted her. Whoa! Whoa! No! Don't you dare say that! Have I ever given you any reason to doubt my loyalty? My wife shook her head. This incident was a major failure on your part, I continued. There have never been such failures on my part. You and I are not morally equal. I've never taken steps towards infidelity, but you? If I'd come home half an hour later, you'd be well on your way to being Tig's toy. And if this happened, the divorce would be unstoppable. I never put you in the position I am in now. 
I paused to calm myself again and noticed that my thoughts were going in circles and that I was starting to build up my rage. I pulled myself together and forced myself to move on. Did anyone witness your bet? I asked. Was anyone else involved in the conversation about this? Letty shook her head. Then the only one who actually knows that you are going back on your word is him. Everyone else will think he is lying or exaggerating. Even if they knew the truth, it wouldn't matter. No one expects you to subject yourself to what he suggested. If saying no makes you feel guilty, you'll have to live with it. It's better to be a happily married word breaker living with the shame of it than an unhappy divorced Tig toy living with ten times the shame. She bit back a sob as she nodded in agreement, completely in agreement. I asked, how do you communicate with Tig? How did you arrange this weekend? We talked in the office. He wanted to write to me on my mobile, but I didn't want that and blocked him. Yesterday in the office he gave me a phone, but I never used it. Honestly. Where is he? In my purse. I picked up her purse from the floor in the closet. It contained a cheap, prepaid phone. Is he? She nodded. I looked through the phone. There was one outgoing SMS with the word test. There have been several incoming SMS in the last hour. Teague wanted to know why she was gone for so long. I asked, Is there anything else you should tell me that we haven't already talked about? If I find out later that you're hiding something else, it's over between us. You know, don't you? She shook her head. This is all. You know everything. I said, Then, it's okay. Please. Please. Can I trust you now? Are you going to try to escape me again? No impulsive change of heart at the last second? With surprising bitterness, she replied, I'm not going anywhere, Andy. You are my man. I'll do whatever you say. I'm not going anywhere. With a silent prayer, he unlocked the door. She tried to smother me with kisses. Now I really didn't want to kiss her. From the anger, the remnants of snot, and the smell of vomit, I was completely out of my mind. However, she was convincing. After a minute, holding my breath, I pushed her away and sent her upstairs to shower and brush her teeth, saying, No contact with Teague for any reason. We need to prepare. She agreed. As she passed me, I touched her arm to stop her. Letty, I like this set of underwear on you. Do me a favor and snap a selfie in front of the bathroom mirror with this set. Will you do it for me? She smiled and nodded. While she showered and got ready, I went to Lonnie's Barbecue, which was located a half mile from the house. I picked up a couple of plates to go, fried chicken and pork with a few sides. This was our favorite dish. It was still early for dinner, but I decided that food would help. While I was waiting, my phone rang. Letty sent a text message with a selfie. She pulled her hair into a ponytail, tidied up her face, and put on makeup just the way I like it. She knows exactly how to push my buttons. The photo took my breath away. The thought of how close we had come to disaster that evening filled me with barely contained rage. For this I wanted my pound of meat from Tig, and he thought about how to get it without ending up in prison. And then it occurred to me that if I involved Letty's brothers in this matter, then most likely I would not have to do anything. While we were eating, I said to Letty, I know that you are very sensitive to your brothers teasing you. I will do my best to keep this little incident just between us. Neither my family nor yours should know about this. The expression on her face showed that she was terribly grateful to me. But... You and I both know that something needs to be done about Bowden Teague. What he did was serious predation. If we don't do anything, he'll start hunting for someone else. For someone who doesn't have our resources. Someone who can't fight back. We must be responsible. Must be adults in this room. She nodded and said, I want him to face justice for what he did. I asked, What does justice mean to you? I don't think he broke any laws with what he did to you. Letty. What he did to get you to sleep with him was despicable, but not illegal. She was silent for a while, and I added, We do have something we can work with, though. Now he is in a hotel room with illegal substances. This is illegal and may be enough to get him arrested. To do something like this, we'll have to get either VC or Little Joe involved. She groaned in horror. 
I said, well, little Joe isn't afraid to break the rules. And VK will do everything according to the rules. I'd rather use VK because he's more likely to keep his mouth shut. Plus, he's been asking me to borrow Pa's vintage ski boat for a while now so he can take Newt and Split on inflatable cheesecake rides. With this, I can try to buy his silence. What Little Joe has is guaranteed results. He will make sure Bowden is stopped, no matter the cost. I'll let you decide. She plucked up her courage and said, Better than VK. I also don't trust Little Joe to keep his mouth shut. I called VK. He answered on the first ring. Andy, how are you and my beautiful sister doing? I answered, not very good, VK. Are you on duty today? No? Fine. I will need a big favor from you. For this, I will be greatly indebted to you. Twenty minutes later, a sheriff's department SUV pull it up in our driveway. VK is Letty's older brother and the scariest of the four. As the chief deputy sheriff in the county, the VC has quite a bit of responsibility. In our state, sheriffs are politicians and do not necessarily have law enforcement experience. The chief deputy sheriff is the top professional in law enforcement, the one who knows how to get the job done and run the department. While the sheriff deals with political issues and works with the commissioner and the public, VC is the chief deputy sheriff for our county and does an excellent job. Unlike his predecessor, he earned the respect of minority communities. Old residents of the city predict that after the current sheriff retires, VK will become the sheriff of the county for the next 20 years. I told VK about what happened to Letty and Bowden Tigom. To save Letty from humiliation, I told everything. At first, VK was very amused by his sister's gullibility. Did you bet double or zero on Georgia to win against Clemson this year? Damn it, no way! This is damn stupidity exclaimed VK. However, as I continued to describe the setup and illegal substances, his cheerful mood soured. He became angrier and angrier. When VK gets angry, he doesn't lose his temper like I do. His lips are pressed tightly together and his eyes are sparkling. That's what makes him so damn scary. I said, now this asshole is in the Garden Inn, room 223. He should have illegal substances with him. Is it possible to search his room under some pretext? Maybe you can use a canine service to track him down. VK said he had a few ideas and went out to his SUV to make some private phone calls. He returned with a smile and said, Good news. An anonymous customer just dialed 911 from a home phone at the Garden Inn. He reported that he overheard a guy in room 223 of the Garden Inn buying illegal substances from a dealer. If the door is open when my guys get there, then we will have everything we need for a legal search. And Letty asked, can't you pretend you're going there and ask him to leave the door open for you? For the past hour, Bowden Teague has been calling the hotline every few minutes and leaving voicemails. He couldn't wait to find out when she would arrive. I handed her the phone and said, Write to him, Letty. Say you're in the parking lot, but you're nervous about being seen standing in the lobby waiting for the door to open. Ask him to leave it open so you can enter right away. She typed an SMS and sent it. Teague did not respond to the request and wrote in response, Where have you been so far? Her phone immediately rang. I told her not to answer. If he starts talking to him, he will probably give us away. Write him an answer. Say that I showed up unexpectedly and that it took you a while to leave me. Tig replied, If you want the door to be open, you must be interested in me. Letty asked, What should I do? I had a sudden inspiration. On my cell phone, I replayed a selfie of Letty wearing a set of lingerie in the bathroom mirror, carefully cropped it so that he could see from the top of her bray to the top of her stockings, and sent it to Letty's phone via Bluetooth. Then he asked Letty to send him an SMS. The close-up of her underwear was revealing, but not identifiable. This photo was enough to make the man lose his mind. Bowden's reaction was immediate. He sent a reply, SMS, best weekend ever. A second later, Teague sent an image from the inside of a hotel room door wide open. VK made a phone call to get things started and then sat down with me in the living room. I used some pretext to send Letty upstairs for a few minutes. When she left, I asked VK to be gentler with Letty. I know I already owe you a big debt for this, but Letty is very sensitive to being fooled. 
She is a smart woman, but naive, and was fooled and caught. I know you really wanted to take the boat I inherited from my pa. If you keep it between the three of us, I'll let you use it one weekend a month for the rest of the year. You can choose which ones, and I'll even keep it tucked in for you. VK laughed and said, Andy, you don't owe me anything. You acted to protect my sister. I expected this from you, otherwise I would never have allowed you to date her. However, I am grateful to you. What you ask me to do is literally my job. Catching him is the least I can do. As for keeping things under wraps, I love little Joe, but you know how his tongue hangs out at both ends. If he found out what happened to Letty, the whole neighborhood would know about it by noon the next day. He will never let her survive this, and that's a fact. Consider me to have common sense and prudence. I agreed and apologized for the possible negative consequences. He smiled and said, Still, I want to borrow your boat. Your dad's vintage ski boat will suffice for one occasion. It would be nice in June, after school ends, and I can take the children on a weekday. Gasoline at my expense. We shook hands. While they were waiting, Letty came down to see her brother. Letty really wanted to have children. We decided to put this off until we had access to the trust. My sister was looking forward to it, but my brother was not. Both advised us to wait. Letty enjoyed motherhood while caring for our many nephews. She gave VK a third-degree interrogation about what was happening to his children. Newt and Rascal are her favorite nephews. In the end, VK called. He laughed in a few places but didn't say anything special. After listening for a couple of minutes, VK said, Okay, great job, Darnell. Thank Carlos for me, too. After which he told us, Bowden Teague was arrested a few minutes ago at the Garden Inn on charges of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute. In the end, they were found on him. He had a significant quantity, empty bags and scales. This indicates intent to distribute. For this, he will definitely receive a prison sentence. Letty, you shouldn't have anything to do with illegal substances. They are not only highly addictive, but also relieve sexual inhibition. I tried my best to control myself. Letty ran her hand soothingly down my back. VK continued. The probable cause for the anonymous tip was not very strong, but Bowden gave himself away. He was smoking in his room when sheriff's deputies walked by. The door was open, so deputies smelled smoke and went inside. Teague tried to push them out. During the scuffle, he dropped a bag of illegal substances in the hallway in front of four witnesses, including the hotel manager and the repairman on duty. After this, he began to behave belligerently and resist. The assistants had to subdue him. The arresting officer was Darnell Billups. He was the one who did it. You know Darnell, right? He is a regular customer at my store, so I nodded. Letty shook her head negatively, and W.C. continued. Bowden was two years ahead of me in school, and his father was a member of the state legislature at the time. He started college four years before you started high school, so you didn't know him. In high school, he bullied children. It took 15 years, but Darnell finally got his revenge. Darnell promised to treat my wife and I to a steak dinner for sending him on this challenge. We had a good laugh about it. Darnell's father was a diesel mechanic who worked for Pa. He bounced between different dealerships depending on what repair work needed to be done. Darnell's family were good people. Pa instilled in me respect for good people. I was glad he got his revenge. Letty asked, and what will happen to Bowden? VK replied, Do you know Laney Wilcox? He is the district attorney, but he is merciless when it comes to prohibited substances. Intent to distribute entails mandatory punishment. If I'm not mistaken, he'll make an example out of Mr. Teague. Then he looked at Letty. Darnell was able to take possession of Tig's cell phone. Is there anything about this phone that you would be embarrassed about? Texts, emails, calls, or photos? Letty replied, Just the photo we just sent. Over the past two years, we called each other a couple of times when we were at trade shows and discussed work schedules. That's all. I want this photo to disappear, VK. VK replied, Already taken care of. When the scene is cleared, Teague's phone is found broken and is reported damaged during the altercation. You owe Darnell for this. 
Darnell would buy a couple boxes of 9mm ammo from me a month and a pallet of 12-gauge shells at the end of the summer. He kept a checking account and paid it in regular payments throughout the year. I mentally noted that this year the payment will be at the expense of the establishment. In addition, once every month or so, he would go into the store looking for a good deal on a gun for his eldest son. A few days ago, I traded in a Remington 870 Wingmaster in good condition. I'll offer him a pretty good deal. About Darnell. I'll take care of it, I said, and left everything as it was. VK nodded in understanding. Letty asked him, What if Bowden says that he was in the room waiting for me? Bowden replied, he won't say. He was arrested for possession of controlled substances. He is smart enough to understand that no one will believe him. Secondly, there is nothing except your phone by which you can be tracked. His phone is broken. If he makes a fuss about his broken phone, we'll get a warrant to look into internet backups and he'll bury himself. Darnell took a closer look at his phone and the last text messages were mostly from Tig's dealer. There is a history of the incriminated transactions. It's unlikely that Tig will say anything that will draw attention to the phone. As far as you are concerned, there is no evidence that you ever owned this phone. I'll take it and it will disappear. Letty asked, Can't the phone be traced to this house? VK replied, A determined investigator can obtain records from the cell phone company and triangulate the phone. In a large city, it is probably possible to track it within a half to quarter mile radius. Here in the countryside, we don't have nearly as many towers. The search can only be narrowed down to a radius of eight miles. There are a hundred houses within an eight mile radius of here, so the answer isn't that simple. If all else fails, I will be in charge of the investigation. VK looked at both of us and said, There is one more thing you should know. When they searched the room, they found some pretty fancy equipment for filming. These cameras are invisible but have high resolution. One of them was on the curtain rod. The other was installed on the chest of drawers. The assistants would not have noticed them if they had not been looking for them. When the assistants entered the room, they were both already working. He had illegal substances and blackmail cameras. I need to draw you a picture of how you were framed. Don't worry about yourself, Letty. Your husband's family is known to be rich. Perhaps he was the target, not you. What could Tig do to Andy, having incriminating materials on you to blackmail? Her face turned white. She didn't answer. Nothing to say? Fine. You barely dodged a bullet, sis. VK asked to speak with Letty alone. I went out into the hallway to give them the room. I looked at them while he spoke to her in a whisper. While he was doing this, Letty looked into my eyes and began to cry again. It was too much for me and I turned away. When VK was about to leave, I thanked him warmly, but he brushed it off as a trifle. Here, families take care of each other. Later that evening, I asked Letty what VK told her. He said that if I ever do to you what our mother did to us, then I better pack my things and leave the district. Otherwise, he himself will punish me and make me cry with grief. That scared me to death, Andy. I've never seen my brother angrier. This is a reference to the fact that Letty's mother, Loretta, ran away from her husband when Letty and her brothers were children. This man turned out to be Lawyer Pa. When I was little, my father owned a number of small car dealerships in South Georgia. He had a whole staff of lawyers working for him from the Augusta Partnership. One of the lawyers went there every week to meet with Pa on current cases. During each of these trips, the lawyer stopped and had lunch at the diner where Loretta worked as a waitress. She had to work there to help her family make ends meet. Letty's family was very respectable, but poor. Country preachers like Letty's father never had much money. Loretta was a beauty, and lawyer Pa took a liking to her. She struggled in life with her destiny. The lawyer was a handsome man and knew how to carry on a conversation. Over time, he slowly seduced Loretta, forcing her to leave her family for him. He promised her an easy and luxurious life in the big city of Augusta. He even said that in a year or two, the children would be able to move in with them. This was all Loretta needed to decide to run away with him. Letty's father Roy was shocked by the incident and lost his position in the church due to the scandal. Pa was furious. The lawyer was his employee, whom he brought to the city, and he felt personally responsible. Pa immediately fired the lawyer. 
The day the deacons of Roy's church asked him to resign, my father hired him as sales manager at his Ford and Lincoln dealership. This was a significant increase in salary compared to the salary of a preacher. Pa tried to support Roy and make a statement to the community. It worked, but it also had an unintended consequence. It was the best business decision Pa ever made. Roy had a reputation for honesty and respect and sold many cars for Pa. Under Roy's leadership, the Ford dealership became the cornerstone of Pa's business empire. Over the next few years, Pa and Roy became the best of friends. A tough businessman everyone fears and a discredited preacher everyone loves. Roy couldn't cook, and his children thought their father could set water on fire. The thought of five growing children eating frozen dinners every night weighed heavily on Ma's conscience, so the Roy family were regular guests at Sunday dinner. Ma stuck to tradition and made sure to spend time with Letty so she could learn to cook. Being the only girl, Letty missed her mother and craved her mother's care and attention. She and Ma had the same sense of humor and could laugh at each other for hours on end. Every Sunday afternoon, Letty and Ma spent hours cooking and laughing. The first time I realized I had fallen in love with Letty was sitting at our kitchen table on a Sunday afternoon, watching her carefully knead cookie dough. There was a flower stain on the tip of her nose. She said something cheerfully, which made my mother laugh so much that she could hardly stand on her feet. While Mom was laughing, Letty looked at me and winked and smiled as if to say, Isn't your mom wonderful? At that moment, my heart began to beat wildly in my chest. I felt dizzy and lighter than air. I was 15 and Letty was 14. She blossomed early and was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. I still remember with perfect clarity how I felt at that moment. It was the best feeling in the world. VK was the first to notice how I felt about Letty. Shortly after that Sunday, he pulled me aside to talk. VK was four years older than me, and at that time he was 15 centimeters and 36 kilograms taller than me. He said, I know you're in love with Letty, Andy. It's written all over your face. My sister, too, although she tries to hide it, has the same strong feelings for you as you do for her. I'm offering you a deal. If you treat her with respect, I will interfere in the affairs of my father and brothers and keep them away from you. I'm a good judge of people, and I think you'll take care of her. This is what I expect. You will take care of her. Don't disappoint me, Andy. Then it seemed to me that he was extremely generous. Years later, I realized that VK would move heaven and earth for my sake. My parents took it upon themselves to help Letty's family, to give them dignity and respectability. Pa and Ma helped them when they needed it most. VK was quite smart and understood what this meant for his family. Pa was a vindictive man. Months after the lawyer was fired, he was still furious, and he spared no expense or resources to make the lawyer regret his decision to persuade Loretta to run away with him. Pa hired the best investigators in the state. Investigators collected a whole treasure trove of incriminating evidence on the lawyer and used it to slowly grind him into dust. In three months, the lawyer lost several cases, a partnership, a license, a fortune, a house, and finally, Loretta. All Pa did was leak the right dirt to the right person at the right time. When Roy heard about what had happened to the lawyer, he stopped by our house. I heard him say to Pa, Proverbs 21.15 says, The administration of justice is joy to the righteous, but fear to those who do wrong. It's good to know that I have friends that the Lord is using to bring about justice. Pa brushed it off as nothing. Families here take care of each other. A few months after Teague's arrest, VK stopped by on my day off to chat. He said there was an incident at Glenville State Prison and that Bowden Teague was dead. I asked VK what happened. He said that after Teague agreed to the minimum sentence, the state sent him to Glenville. In the very first week of his imprisonment, Teague was killed. It could have been any of hundreds of witnesses and no one said anything. He said the warden contacted the sheriff to see if anyone in the area might have a grudge against Teague. The chief told the sheriff that there were rumors in the prison that several years ago Teague met a young Hispanic woman who worked at a bar, got her hooked on illegal substances, and destroyed her marriage. Rumor has it that the family found out he was in Glenville and paid off a notorious Central American gang to get revenge. The sheriff asked the VC to look into this and call the chief back. I asked, and what did you tell the boss? He answered very carefully. I checked everything and didn't find anything. 
Hypothetically speaking, if I knew who this family was, I probably wouldn't tell the boss who it was. The family would be under suspicion of conspiracy to commit murder. This is a very serious charge, the legal fight against which will be expensive. Perhaps the family is not involved in this matter at all, because this is just a rumor in the prison yard. But even if the rumor is true, the person who told the family that Tig is in Glenville is not guilty of anything. What Tig is in prison is a well-known fact. The man simply brought it to their attention. In response, I told him about how I overheard his father quoting Pa's parables. He had never heard this story and was surprised. I looked at his face to make sure he understood what I was saying. Once I was sure I understood, I said, It's nice to know that I have friends too. VK smiled broadly and patted me on the shoulder saying, I'm glad we understand each other so well, Andy. Letty couldn't have chosen a better man. In the week since I caught her, Letty and I tried to have sex half a dozen times. I was still so angry that I was having trouble following through. This had never happened to me before, and it completely demoralized me. As soon as the time came, I became sluggish as a noodle. Letty took this as a refusal and cried inconsolably for several hours afterwards. This didn't help me much either. I decided to see my doctor. The doctor declared me physically healthy and referred me to a psychologist. The psychologist he recommended was an older hippie woman named Mido Zorana. Her office is located in Macon. I really liked Mido. She is down to earth, worldly, and approaches the situation with humor, which I found very funny. I told her the story of what happened, using humor and irony to ease the pain. She laughed in all the places where I would laugh if someone told this story to me in a similar way. She has a phenomenal whole-body laugh. She worked with me twice a week for several months to help me deal with my anger constructively. As I learned to manage my anger effectively, my functioning returned. However, making love to Letty was clumsy and awkward. My trust in her was still broken. I treated the symptoms, but did not correct the underlying problem. Letty gently supported me when I arranged couples counseling with Meadow. Meadow began couples counseling by asking us to share our goals. My goals were surprisingly different from Letty's, I said. My goal is to overcome my anger and feelings of betrayal. I want to restore our trust to what it was before I returned home that day. Letty replied, My goal is that I want to understand whether I am so damn stupid. Seriously, that's exactly what she told the consultant. When Letty said this, Meadow almost exploded. She laughed so hard that she couldn't speak. For almost a full minute, she suddenly stopped laughing, sat up and said, Oh, damn it, Letty, you made me wet myself. And she ran into the bathroom. The way it was done made Letty and I laugh wildly. It was therapeutically useful. For the first time in a long time, I relaxed around Letty and placed my hand in hers. She beamed at me for the first time in weeks. Meadow was surprisingly effective in helping us. But even so, it wasn't easy. I can't imagine how much harder it would have been if Letty had even gotten to Tig's hotel room for just a few minutes. I often thank my lucky stars that I caught it just before I left. The first three sessions we walked in circles. What bothered me most was that Letty was clearly aroused by the prospect of being sexually used by a man I knew she despised. The stories that came to mind when I thought about the reasons for her reaction took me to a very dark place. Letty, in turn, repeatedly denied that she was even aroused. This was especially maddening because it was so physically obvious. Meadow and I discussed this of necessity in individual consultations, and she knew that this was my main problem. At the fourth consultation, idealist Meadow finally had enough of Letty's blandishments and tricked her into admitting her arousal. After admitting this, Letty burst into tears. Once she had collected herself, Meadow spent the rest of the session exploring how Letty's arousal made me feel. I think for the first time Letty understood the depth of my feelings and the self-doubt I faced. She left that session with a grim determination to help me understand her actions and regain my trust in myself. For the next month, sessions were held only between Letty and Meadow. When we returned to our doubles practice, Meadow surprised me with her first question. She repeated the terms of the bet, 
and then asked if I would like to get the same deal from Letty someday. I responded, speaking directly to Letty. I'd love to make the same deal with you that Tig did, minus the illegal substances, of course. I wanted to try so many things with you, but you didn't allow me. You even refused to try something that you obviously like. I would give anything to have you as my slave, and I could do whatever I want with you. Hell yes, all day, every day. Letty looked at me with shock and surprise. I asked her rhetorically, How is it possible that you don't even know about my feelings for you? My wife turned beet red as she said, Andy, I come from a very conservative family. I... Letty fell silent without finishing her thought. Meadow noticed her discomfort and said, Letty, remember what we talked about. You must be honest and frank. We should tell him about that phone call. He should know. I waited patiently to hear what my wife would say. She gathered her strength and began. Not long before my mom left us, I came home early one day because softball practice was canceled that day. When I returned, I heard my mother talking on the phone. She talked very openly about sex. I thought she was talking to dad and was shocked. This was a side of my parents that I had never seen before. This both outraged and delighted me. A week later, my mother left us. When I came home, I expected dad to be at home, but he was called to the hospital. Because of this visit, I was the one who found the note she left on the kitchen table. The note was addressed to my father, but I read it. In the letter, my mother wrote that my father never provided her with an acceptable standard of living and did not satisfy her sexually, so she is leaving for someone who can do both. Attached to the letter were divorce papers. Only later did I realize that on the phone, she was not talking to dad, but to the man with whom she ran away. It was traumatic. I never got over it, and it gave me an unhealthy view of female sexuality. I was shocked by this story. The thing is, I have a very strong libido, Andy. I got this from my mother, I'm sure. Meadow made me take a survey, and based on my responses, it's at the top of my list. She turned to our consultant. What was the result, Meadow? Meadow replied, Letty is more than two sigma above the median 95%. Her self-rated libido is higher than 97% of all women. Letty nodded and said, I've been masking and hiding this side of myself from you for years, and I did it for two reasons. Firstly, I was afraid that you would see in me the likeness of my mother, a dissolute woman whose desires are stronger than loyalty to the family. Secondly, I was afraid to let the beast out of the cage. I was afraid that if I gave in to my passion, it would consume me. I suppressed it so as not to lose control. After a long silence, Meadow said quietly, You need to continue, Letty. You need to discuss your arousal that day. You know from our last group session how much this hurt, Andy. You must be as honest as possible. Letty said, After losing my last bet with Bowden, where both illegal substances and my virtue were at stake, I thought I would be terrified and filled with fear. But instead, it suddenly caught fire. I was excited all day. This had nothing to do with Bowden. He was absolutely disgusting to me. It had nothing to do with infidelity. I had no desire to cheat on you, and I was completely satisfied with you. What really fascinated me was the idea that I would do something that I couldn't admit to myself that I wanted. The prospect of being forced into this seemed quite liberating to me. It wasn't because of Bowden. It's not that I'm cheating on you. The point is that I could let the beast out of its cage without feeling guilty. I couldn't wait to find out what it was like. I looked at Meadow in bewilderment. Is this real? Does Letty want to be forced into sexual acts to avoid guilt? Sounds like fiction. It's real, Meadow replied. In English, the word promiscuous woman refers to a woman who is promiscuous and has many sexual partners. Women with high libidos find it difficult to balance their sexual drive with social pressure to discriminate in sexual relationships. This leads to several behavior patterns. First, women with high libidos often suppress their sexuality. Secondly, they are looking for ways to psychologically justify their choice of sexual partners. For example, the epidemic of drunk sex culture among students is one example of how women try to justify their high libido. If they are drunk, they can say to themselves, I am not a slutty woman, I was just drunk. In Letty's case, 
She said that being forced gave her a feeling of release. She can say to herself, I am not a dissolute woman who chooses this herself. I was foresaid. I began to object, snapping, but this is sophistry. In fact, she made a choice that... Miato interrupted me with a gesture, giving me an indignant look, as if I were a particularly stupid student. Andy, you asked if it was real, not if it made sense or if it was logical. I know this sounds outrageous to you, but avoiding guilt through externalizing your locus of control is a surprisingly common phenomenon. It is hypothesized that this is one of the reasons why submissive sexual relationships are attractive to a surprisingly large percentage of the population. I thought about it and then asked Meadow, Do you believe Letty? Meadow replied, Letty and I have discussed this issue thoroughly, Andy. I am absolutely convinced that she is telling the truth. Moreover, I do not believe that she is hiding any other motive than what she voiced. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter what I think. This is something you must decide for yourself. Letty looked at me intently, concern written all over her face. She was waiting for me to say something. I looked at Meadow, and so did she. Confused, I asked, Was there a question for me? Did I miss it? Meadow replied, For several sessions, you wanted to get Letty to explain why she was so excited when she was preparing to go to the hotel TIG. She just gave it to him. Do you accept her explanation? That's all. As Dad said, these were essential details. Did I believe Letty and Meadow? I approached Letty directly. Letty, when we got married, I promised you that I would be faithful until the end of my days. Nobody forced me to do this. I decided to make this promise because I loved you. You were and remain amazing, attractive, and desirable. We got a little crazy when I made this promise to be faithful, but I respect your desire to walk down the aisle a virgin. I know that I have a very strong libido, and I was afraid that yours would not match mine. I hoped and prayed that we would have it in sync. When I saw how at times you let loose, let yourself go, have fun, greedily taste joy, I took it as a sign that you could match me in sexual passion. I walked to the altar anticipating sexual adventures with you for the rest of my life. When we finally made love, there was no disappointment. You were not shy, you liked to receive physical pleasure from me, and with every action in bed you made it clear that you loved me with your heart, body, and soul. However, throughout our marriage, you hid something from me. I didn't try to do what I know for sure you would like. You resist experiments. She didn't let us move to the next level. I couldn't understand why. This was a source of self-doubt for me. The fact that you have a high libido doesn't scare me, doesn't outrage me, doesn't make me insecure. It gives me joy. What frustrates me is knowing that you have a high libido that you refuse to fully share with me. I haven't yet understood why sex is bad for a married couple. Truth be told, he's always good. I heard your father preach a sermon on this subject before he left his ministry. He said that for married couples... Their bodies belong to each other. I don't remember exactly how he said it, but it was scripture. Married couples should give control of their bodies to their spouses. They must keep each other alive so that both can avoid the temptation to break their vows. Letty intervened. Corinthians. This is from the Corinthians. I nodded. I take your word for it. You know that I am not a Bible scholar. In any case, if I understand correctly what your father taught, God gave the pleasure of sex in marriage as a consolation. As long as it occurs within the framework of a legal marriage, what spouses do in bed of their own free will does not displease God. If it is not disgusting to God and brings us comfort, then why don't we do it? Help me understand, why do we avoid finding comfort in each other? If letting me make decisions about sex helps you feel less guilty, I'm more than willing to do it. With readiness, I'll take it, take this blame upon yourself. As I already said, hell yes, all day, every day. For me, there is no fear, no disgust, no uncertainty in sex. I just ask that you be honest with me. We decided to become partners for the rest of our lives. I think I deserve the truth from you. The look on Letty's face confirmed that this decision was the right one. 
Passion rush it inside and flare it up with a bright flame. I glanced over at Midao to see her reaction, and it was clear from the look on her face that she thought I had hit the nail on the head. However, Meadow said, Andy, you haven't answered the question asked of you. Do you accept her explanation? I turned to my wife and said, Letty, with your explanation, you asked me to accept three things. First, admit that you had no desire, lust, or interest in having sex with Bowden Teagum. At these words, her face tensed. I accept this unconditionally, I said. I believe in it. Relief spread across her face. Secondly, you asked me to accept the fact that you were not disappointed in me, that you had no desire to cheat on me, and that you consider me an excellent sexual partner. Her face filled with tension again. I accept this unconditionally. I believe in it. She smiled even wider, her relief palpable. Thirdly, you asked me to agree that the reason you were aroused that day was because you were suppressing your high libido, and the prospect of being enslaved by a man who planned to use you sexually gave you the opportunity to realize your libido without associated feelings of guilt. She smiled, anticipating my answer. I can't agree with this at all, I said. To me it sounds like complete nonsense of a psychopath. Letty's face showed horror. She closed her eyes, and tears began to stream down her cheeks. Meadows' expression was equal parts worry, panic, and disappointment. I continued. Agreeing with Sucha Blatant's statement without any evidence, I would be a complete fool. What kind of fool do you take me for? I paused for a moment to let that sink in before springing the trap. During this time, both Letty and Meadow took a deep breath to say something. Before they could do it, I said, what you claim can be verified. I need evidence. Need a demonstration. Show that your statement is true, Letty. Fifteen seconds later, Meadow burst out laughing at the top of her lungs. Only after this did Letty finally understand what I meant. After that, Letty and I haggled for almost half an hour. She made counteroffers, then tried to lower the price, and then completely begged me. I stood my ground. You were going to give Tig three days. I want a whole year. 365 full days to do whatever I want with you. I am at least 120 times more important to you than Bowden Teague. I think this is reasonable. In fact, I believe that I am 1,200 times more important to you, so be glad that you are not asking for 10 years. In less than a year, I greatly underestimated myself. She said, But Andy, you have to be reasonable. I said, Letty, the whole point of this exercise is that you are trying to convince me that giving a man control over your sexuality turns you on. When you negotiate nonstop to keep me from taking control, you only weaken your argument. When I said this, Meadow laughed. I got the impression that if she had popcorn, she would be eating it right now. Letty said, so what do you insist on? Do you want me to agree to 365 days under your control? Do you guarantee me that after this time you will agree that I am telling the truth? I said, let's be really precise. I want to use inductive reasoning to verify the truth of your statement. We will make many repeated observations under different conditions, looking for a consistent result. How you feel about the fact that I am in charge here will be determined by your obedience. If your words are true, then I expect to see 365 days of immediate and complete submission. Immediate and complete submission means that you do what I say when I say it. You won't argue, to bargain. You won't act half-heartedly. I want you to ride or die for one year. If you do this for a year, I will believe you. She closed her mouth and dropped her jaw. Not a very good sign. I began to worry that I had overplayed my hand and that my tactical victory here would turn into a strategic defeat. She asked, how much time do I have to think about your proposal? I answered, I'll give you three days to think about it. Meadow asked me to spend the rest of the session alone. When they left the consultant's office at the end of the session, Meadow looked at me and grinned like a Cheshire cat. Three days later, when I returned home from shopping, Letty was waiting for me at the kitchen table. She had already drunk two glasses of Chardonnay and was putting a bandage on the inside of her left wrist. I asked about the bandage. She peeled it off, 
Tattooed on her wrist in neat small print were the words, Jump or Die. She said, I want to do this for you. As far as I understand, I am your slave, with whom you will do whatever you want for the next 365 days. I won't refuse you for any reason. If this stays within our marriage, I will ride or die. Nobody but you or me. This is not discussed. I said, I told you a couple of nights ago that this goes without saying. You are mine, and I have no intention of sharing. She raised her wrist and said, I ride or die. I got up and followed her into the bedroom. She was very excited. Over the next year, not a single day passed without sex. I made sure we were doing something every day. Even if we were tired, irritated, or had a lot to do, I still did it. She stuck to her promise to never deny me anything. I respected how she felt about it, making it easier for her. For the first couple of months, we focused on getting Letty used to what she called full access. She was traditional and conservative, and it took her a little time to relax and accept all the things I wanted to try. It was necessary to overcome psychological barriers. The first time we succeeded. When we talked about it afterwards, she became hoarse from loud moans. It was then that she stopped holding back her libido. Having learned that such sensations were possible, she never held back. Within six months, we had exhausted my entire wish list. I did everything I could think of. When I admitted this to Letty, she, to my surprise, asked me to expand the boundaries of our capabilities. I went back to Meadow and asked for advice on how to do this. She did some research and gave me a surprisingly comprehensive list of activities to try. Half of them I've never even heard of, and my Google search history would make a slutty French woman blush with shame. She also advised me to have Letty do her own research. I asked Letty to look at adult sites on the internet and send me links to stories that she found interesting. So we found a dozen things to try. When she provided me with her list, Meadow also gave advice that I took to heart, saying, Remember that what excites her, what she wants to do, and what she is ready to do are three different lists. Just because something turns her on doesn't mean she actually wants to do it. And even if she really wants to, that doesn't mean she'll do it. Do you understand? Women often have fantasies about varied sex and other similar things. Very few of these women would actually think about doing something like this. Just because something excites Letty doesn't mean she's attracted to it. If you decide to take this deep dive, don't stare into the abyss trying to figure out why something turns her on. Just accept it and use it to please her. I know Letty well. Enough to know that in the end, you are the only one she really thinks about. You should know this too. Later that week, I made Letty act out something. After that, she felt ashamed of her reaction. She was afraid that I would think that she had become a slutty woman, looking for sex with other men. I told her about the advice Meadow had given me, and honestly said that I had no plans to look into the abyss. Considering what we had just experienced, it was difficult for her to accept, but she decided to trust me. Over time, I saw that I was not jealous about this. As a result, she began to talk much more openly about what turns her on. Using Meadow's list, we tried a lot of things that most average couples would never consider. We liked most of it and found some truly unexpected twists on what turns her on. One day I decided that we would try something that would be unconventional for almost everyone. I didn't like it at all, but Letty was overjoyed. She was shaking with excitement. After that, with an astonished expression on her face, she stretched out on the bed asking, Where does it come from? I don't think you could find another woman who would enjoy it as much. She wanted to joke, but after she said it, a thoughtful expression appeared on her face. She said, I would never have done this without your desire, and look how I reacted. Now do you understand what I was talking about in Meadow's office? Not feeling guilty allowed me to enjoy myself. I think that today I justified myself. I agreed. It was an amazing year. Our sexual relationship has undergone a renaissance. Letty blossomed like the opening bud of a beautiful rose. In situations where she usually felt insecure, I often saw her absent-mindedly fiddling with the tattoo, drawing courage and determination from it. Sexual experiments, submission, and daily sex suited her.
For the first time since we met, she didn't have a single failed week for the entire year. She became happier, less irritable, and much less anxious. She knew that I liked everything and that I loved her, which greatly increased her self-confidence. For me, daily sex was just wonderful. I walked as if I owned the ground I walked on. A lot of what I do in the gun shop involves negotiation. I stopped trying to act like Pa's tough businessman and relaxed when interacting with customers. I realized that when buyers see that I negotiate in good faith and am not trying to deceive them, it is easier for them to agree to a good deal. The old aphorism is true. Confidence helps in negotiations. I was simply unstoppable at work. Financially, our store was doing well. I have received three separate buyback offers from other stores in our part of the state. They were all profitable, but for the sake of my employees, I stuck with the business. I kept all the suggestions to myself, but somehow the information leaked out anyway. J.D. Butler, the county commissioner, came into my store one afternoon and said, Andy, I heard that you rejected a buyout offer from J. Crown Tactical Macon. This is true? I admitted that this was true and said, It's a lot of money, but I couldn't bring myself to agree. We love this country, Mr. Butler. I don't think I can even use a crowbar to uproot Letty from here. He said, I have to admit, when I found out that you went to college in Atlanta, I didn't think you'd come home. Figured you would disappear into the wilds of Atlanta, just like your brother and sister did. But you surprised us all by returning home and clearly devoting yourself to the future of the district. I'm proud of you, son. That's why I wanted to come to you to talk frankly about the upcoming business deal. J.D. negotiated to buy out the remaining businesses on the county's main street and redevelop it. The old buildings on this street are magnificent brick structures with huge windows, wooden floors, and speak of a bygone era of prosperity. With a little care, these buildings will remain magnificent a hundred years from now. J.D.'s son Tyler, who works as a sous chef at a three-star Michelin bistro in Atlanta, is tired of city life, and his wife is pregnant. He decided to return home to the county to open a farm-to-table restaurant. Tyler was looking to take advantage of a trend that has day-trippers coming from Augusta and Atlanta looking for a taste of country life. Lonnie, the owner of Lonnie's Barbecue, plans to move his restaurant two doors down from Tyler's and open a high-end coffee, bakery, and ice cream shop with his niece. Family Howard's is going to convert an old supermarket into an old store, everything for a nickel or a dime. J.D. wanted me to move my store to the old Farmer's Bank building. Part of Uncle Kevin's store is a display of the guns that conquered the West. J.D. thinks this will give city dwellers something interesting and rustic to gawk at while they wait for their tables. At first, I was quite skeptical. One of the benefits of a gun store is that we don't have to pay rent or a mortgage on the building. However, deep down I know that the store's main weakness is that it is located in the middle of nowhere. I understand that if we were in the city center and had better parking, we would get more visitors. I was convinced by this idea when J.B. took me through the old bank building. This is a stone building built in a different era, which gives it solidity. All shop fittings are brass, the cash register is ideal for sales on the floor, and the huge storage unit from the 30s is still in perfect working order. It can store goods with minimal risk of theft. The county took ownership of the bank for non-payment of taxes. I can buy the building for the amount owed in taxes if I agree to operate a store in the building for 10 years. The tax amount is 30% of the assessed value of the building. I discussed this with Letty, my staff, and my siblings, and we found nothing wrong with it. My sister, who administered the family trust, allowed me to borrow funds early against her future share of the trust. I bought the bank building and moved my store there. It was the best business decision I've ever made. As part of what Meadow calls trust work, Letty and I have been working hard to be much more open and transparent with each other about what's going on in our heads and away from home. Every evening, we went through a series of questions that forced us to reveal our secrets. Using this list, we learned to talk about what was uncomfortable for us. I gave everyone the day off on Black Friday so they could spend more time with their families on Thanksgiving. I was alone in the store when an old school friend, Florence Benson, stopped by to chat. At school, Florence was an insecure, skinny blonde who is known to be a late bloomer. 
For a time in high school, Florence was Letty's main rival for my affections. As an adult, Florence turned into the typical stunning blonde. Think Kate Hudson with a friendlier smile. It was very pleasant for us to communicate. She went to Carnegie Mellon to study, among other things, musical theater. Obviously, she matured in her first year and achieved considerable success there. She had just completed a 24-month stint in the Broadway play Wicked, first as a swing performer and then as Glinda's understudy. She recently landed the role El Faba in the traveling production Wicked. She returned home for Thanksgiving to spend time with her family, since she knew that she would not be able to see them for a long time when she went on tour. Around 4 p.m., I invited Florence to have dinner with me and Letty. She politely declined and surprised me by suggesting, we have sex. She promised that she would behave carefully and that no one in the area would know about it. I'm ashamed to admit, but I was incredibly tempted. Florence is smart, talented, beautiful, and her adult body is simply amazing. But most importantly, her interest in me was very flattering. She could have anyone. Her last boyfriend was an outfielder for the New York Yankees. Of all the people on earth who could interest her, I was the only one whom she could not forget. It took all my willpower to politely decline. It helped that I knew that in just a few hours, I would have to answer Letty's question about whether I had been tempted that day. After Florence left, I closed the store, drove straight home, and immediately told Letty exactly what happened. I thought that anger, jealousy, and hysteria would begin. Instead, she was delighted by my refusal and tried her best to convince me that I had made the right choice. This week, she simply exhausted me. She worked hard to get that number to 30, but I was too exhausted. Letty was ruthless and insatiable. Four months later, Letty returned home from a business trip to Atlanta. There, she looked through the ledger's ever part together with the external auditors, and immediately said that Wade Banks, an account manager for the external audit group, had approached her. Letty has known Wade for many years and considered him a good friend. She had already mentioned him, and I knew everything about him. This is an extremely attractive guy, a recent widower. Letty said that after Wade suffered the death of his wife, she tried to be a friend he could talk to through his grief. Over dinner on his last trip, Wade said he was in love with her and asked if she would be the first woman to make love to him since his wife died. She admitted with shame that she was very tempted. What attracted her was that she knew what a good person he was and had a sincere desire to help him heal and move on with his life. She said, It took me a lot of willpower to say no, but I did it. I knew that upon my return I would have to answer questions about whether I had been tempted. I wasn't going to lie about it and it helped me refuse. Following her example, I did not become jealous or upset, but decided to reward her for the right decision. I just wore her down that week. The more we practiced being open about difficult topics, the easier it became. We have learned to fight temptation together, not separately. Learned to be honest when dealing with the trauma resulting from her argument with Tig. We became closer than ever, I ended up selling my father's vintage ski boat to VK. One time in June was enough to get him completely hooked on it. After the third weekend, I told him to just leave the boat at home. I admit that the sight of my dad's boat always made me sad, and it was a relief to remove it from my garage. When VK felt guilty for using it so often, he made a generous offer. I used that money to take Letty and I on our second honeymoon to Disney. Letty always wanted to go there. I don't know about the rest of the year, but for eight days in February, I can personally confirm that this is truly the happiest place on earth. When our year came to an end, I was sad, but I was grateful. On our last night, we went to Atlanta, and I took her to a fancy dinner to celebrate. Put on my best suit and tie. Letty put on her latest little black dress with fancy red lingerie underneath. Her new little black dress was even more stunning than the one she ruined when she vomited on it. While we were waiting for coffee and dessert after dinner, she went to the toilet. When I returned, I tried to explain to her as best as I could what this year meant to me and how grateful I was to her for giving it to me. I officially accepted her explanation from the year before, 
and was just finishing speaking when she put her fingers to my lips, silencing me. She said, Andy, what you allowed yourself to do this year was the biggest bet of my life. You could be cruel and make me unhappy. You think you were lucky, but I can honestly say that I won. My gamble paid off in spades. She ran her index finger over her tattoo. Just below the inscription, Ride or Die, it now read, Forever. She clung to me, and I smelled peach pie. She asked, What do you want to bet now so we can continue? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.